Good evening all to the 67th session of the weekly huddle. I'm your host Anup and joining me today is my friend and co-host Praneet. We are cardiologists working at Care Hospital. As most of you know, the huddle is an unscripted audience level interaction where we address common clinical scenarios that we encounter in our daily clinical practice. We typically pick up a topic or a clinical case like what we have done today, and we try to restrict our discussion around that. The basic premise of the huddle is to bring our casual hallway discussions to a more organized platform like this one and share our ideas. While we do welcome science and guidelines, with the huddle, we intend to help a physician translate established knowledge to clinical practice, taking local factors and practice patterns in India into account. This is not a speaker and an audience model, rather a casual interaction, which means any of the attendees can raise their hand or unmute themselves to give their input. And as a courtesy, you should wait for others to finish their thoughts before you unmute yourself. Having said that, I'll get started with my uh, today's uh, topic. So I have shared the, um, the case de uh, details on the huddle WhatsApp group. I'll just speak it out for the attendees here, and then I'll ask uh, my co-host Pranit for his initial impression. And then we will ask our attendees for uh, their comments as well. So this is a 29-year-old female whom I saw a couple of weeks ago. She was referred from an infertility clinic. So she had been trying to conceive for a few years, but uh, was unsuccessful. Her initial uh, workup uh, at her uh, gynecologist uh, was uh, not contributory to any particular pathology. So they were planning to go for uh, in vitro fertilization. She happens to be hypertensive for about two years for which she takes a combo tablet of ramipril and hydrochlorothiazide. So her obstetrician sent uh, this patient to me uh, for, uh, for an evaluation before she undergoes uh, in vitro fertilization treatment. So in my OPD, she is uh, not having any major symptoms. She's otherwise uh, feeling okay. She does not check her blood pressure at home. The last time she visited uh, a cardiologist or a physician was more than a year ago. About two years back, she remembers when she was diagnosed with hypertension, she does not remember getting any um, major investigations or any specific investigation done particularly for her hypertension other than routine investigation. And uh, this has been a stable dose for her for the past two, two years, that is ramipril 5 milligrams daily and hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 milligrams daily. She does have a family history of hypertension where both her parents are hypertensive and she has an elder brother who is also hypertensive. There is no family history of diabetes or heart disease. In the OPD, her blood pressure was 138 over 88 with a heart rate of 82. Her physical examination is within normal limits I did check for her distal pulses and uh, those were also all right. Uh, so the discussion for uh, today, and I, and I am omitting the lab work for the purpose of today's discussion. So you guys can suggest what all lab work you would, uh, you would do for this patient. So the discussion for today's uh, topic is how aggressive should we be in search for secondary causes for hypertension in young females? And I'm talking with in relation to young males. Uh, should we be very specific about uh, what all investigations we should do or how much should we explore uh, to find a secondary cause for hypertension in these young female? We are talking about mid twenties to late twenties like in, like in this particular case. And then what is our standard workup? The drug of choice for hypertension management in the females of childbearing age understanding that certain drugs are not recommended uh, in case if uh, uh, ladies or uh, this particular patient would intend to uh, get pregnant, then certain medications certainly are not recommended. So uh, is it something that should modify our hypertension management? And then in this particular patient, how to best manage this patient's hypertension before pregnancy, which is now, during pregnancy, which with the IVF treatment, you hope that she will conceive. And then immediately after pregnancy, in terms of how the medication regimen should be modified or adjusted. And uh, that I can understand will be a combined decision of cardiologist as well as obstetrician, but uh, the buck will stop with a cardiologist or a physician. So certainly we have a very important role to play 
to uh, manage her hypertension, to prevent the episodes of eclampsia or preeclampsia during pregnancy, and to also prevent the episodes of hypertension that sometimes uh, uh, ladies do undergo after uh, delivery, that is postpartum. So with this background, let me uh, ask Pranit uh, about his opinion. So Pranit, if this patient comes to you, this is the first visit. So we have got three basic questions. Number one, work up for secondary hypertension. What do you do? What do you not do? And how aggressive? Two, how do you typically manage hypertension in uh, young females? And three, what would you do particularly in this particular patient? Pranit, all yours. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So this uh, patient um, who is hypertensive and who is taking an ACE inhibitor for her management of uh, hypertension, an ACE and a thiazide diuretic for management of hypertension, um, uh, planning to conceive. <clears throat> now, ACE inhibitors uh, are not uh, indicated for someone who uh, in pregnant women because of its uh, effect on fetus. So patient definitely needs to be uh, switched over from ACE inhibitor to another molecule. Even uh, thiazide diuretic also because of uh, volume depletion or being a diuretic belonging to a class of diuretic also has been said to uh, produce some side effects uh, in, uh, in the fetus in the form of uh, uh, volume depletion, some growth restrictions, um, oligohydramnios, etc. So both the drugs, in my opinion, are uh, not indicated for her when she is uh, planning to conceive. Now, the questions that are being asked uh, about uh, evaluating for secondary hypertension, um, for me, someone who is in that um, definition of secondary hypertension, like less than 18 years or more than uh, 55, then probably I would be working up into secondary hypertension. So for me, the threshold of uh, evaluating for secondary hypertension, at least in this case, is low. So I will not um, evaluate any causes of secondary hypertension. Probably I will look into the basic labs in the terms of uh, <clears throat> complete blood picture and urine examination create then and if they are okay probably i'll uh, leave it at this point of time but if there is anything suggestive then equally i will uh, evaluate for secondary hypertension so my threshold is high so i, I will not uh, evaluate for secondary hypertension regarding the management of uh, this patient uh, when before preconception conception and post uh, postpartum <clears throat> during pregnancy um, I I would uh, switch over to uh, calcium channel blocker, which is uh, said to be safer. Though there are no um, great randomized trials to to tell which is uh, safe or which is recommended. Um, nifedipine is something which we have been known from the days of uh, MBBS to be safe, at least from the pregnancy stand uh, standpoint. Uh, uh, controlling the hypertension or not having any adverse effects on the fetus. The challenge being the reflex tachycardia and a shorter acting uh, agent. My choice uh, with the current uh, literature, at least something favoring, though not recommended, is amlodipine. And uh, because amlodipine is an established uh, antihypertensive in, um, in adults, uh, I would be uh, switching this patient from ramipril hydrochlorothiazide combination to amlodipine. And probably I may not, I may be okay accepting uh, some high, higher numbers, not very rigid on uh, uh, controlling the hypertension, but maybe accepting slightly higher hypertension, not being too aggressive in uh, adding other drugs, which may equally compromise the safety of the fetus. Then, um, uh, so preconception, you change uh, all throughout the pregnancy, you continue the same thing. And maybe postpartum also because uh, in lactating women, these drugs are um, contraindicated. I would continue this patient on amlodipine, hopefully uh, controlling this uh, the hypertension with amlodipine alone. The challenge becomes um, when these patients are not able to control with amlodipine alone, where beta blockers are sometimes considered to be the drugs of choice. Um, with some uh, issue on uh, fetal growth uh, retardation, but uh, probably metoprolol is something, though not a good antihypertensive, but I would consider this as a second line antihypertensive. 
If patient goes into any of the emergencies, probably go to labetalol. My experience of using the other drugs like uh, methyl dopa or uh, other drugs is limited. So uh, I may not choose them, though I have read about it. So my experience is limited. So these are the two drugs or group of drugs. One calcium channel blockers and beta blockers will manage on uh, for this patient. Uh, so the third question was, you know, uh, uh, what was that? So if this patient was not planning for IVF, it's just a random young female coming with hypertension. Hmm. What, what is the drug of choice? Is it same as any other hypertensive patient or you select based upon their potential for childbearing in the future? So in general, the drugs of choice would be to start with an ACE inhibitors diuretic. So I would be uh, continuing probably the ramipril and titrating the dose of uh, the drugs, uh, but if uh, she is planning to conceive, and I would ask her about uh, the plan of conception, and then I would change accordingly. But if there is no plan of uh, conception and pregnancy, then I would be happy to continue the same uh, two drugs: the ravipril and hydrochlorothiazide. Okay, thank you so much, Pranit. Let us uh, con let us continue our discussion. I'll ask a few of my uh, my colleagues. Uh, for their opinion, uh, let me see. Doctor Doctor Vijay Reddy is here with us. Uh, Doctor Vijay, if I could have you uh, unmute yourself and share your thoughts about today's discussion that we are having. Good evening, Anup, and very good evening to all of you. My thoughts in this case: <clears throat> she is a young lady who is planning for pregnancy. So here. In this case, young woman, we have to the chance of secondary hypertension is very high. It is in the range of nine to eleven percent. The causes mostly be whether it is a renal parenchymal disease or renal vascular disease or other pheochromocytoma um, uh, and uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. Because of the high incidence of secondary hypertension in a young woman, I would like to investigate apart from the routine investigations for um, end organ damage. That is, that is number one. Number two, the young lady who is planning for pregnancy, I don't, I don't start either ACE inhibitors or ARBs because we don't know when she will become pregnant. And by the time he is, she is aware of that he has become pregnant, already the damage might have occurred. Because ACE inhibitors are known, known to produce oligohydramnias and renal, renal abnormalities in the in the fetus. So I would, I don't start ACE inhibitors or AR basis in young woman. My first choice of drugs in young woman is always a calcium channel blocker, preferably a long-acting dipdepone. And the second one, though the Evidence is more in favor of this. The second choice is amlodipine. That is uh, number two drugs. And beta blockers, but they are only the second choice of drugs. In the in case of acute emergencies, intravenous labetalol, that is uh, one thing. In um, alpha methyl dopa, when, the, when she becomes pregnant, usually they are giving up to the dose of 1000 mg, 250 to 500 milligrams TAD, like that. But for a young woman, my, cho my choice is don't start ACE inhibitors, always start with the uh, nipidepin, and it should be evaluated thoroughly. That is my take. Thank you, sir. My question to you before uh, you un before you mute yourself is calcium. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Calcium channel blockers in women, particularly going for pregnancy, uh, I'm already sensing the issue with leg edema. How do you manage such, or you think most of this is well tolerated? What is your impression? Please, please repeat. Um, I am unable to hear you. Yeah. So. Calcium channel blocker, we know in our routine practice, one of the biggest problem with this dihydropyridine drugs is uh, leg edema. And that becomes often challenging in ladies who are pregnant because they already are predisposed towards leg edema. 
So do yeah. you consider that as a problem or you think most of the time they tolerate it quite well? Yeah, so the pedal edema is one of the very common uh, side effect of this uh, calcium channel because of uh, vasodilatation. We can ignore and uh, we, can, uh, we can start with calcium channel blockers only because they are the because in 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 hypertension they, our uh, uh, our spectrum of this i mean drugs is very narrow the therapeutic window is of the drugs is very narrow we cannot use is the which are the class 1 drugs in other hypertensive states cannot use and beta blockers also is just and the diuretics also absolutely no especially hydrochlorothiazide so this pedal edema we can ignore and uh, go ahead uh, because we are giving for only for a short period. Afterwards, we can, uh, switch, we can switch over to other group of drugs. Pregnancy, we should be very cautious and we should be very mindful of the uh, uh, safety rather than minor uh, side effects. And sir, last question. This is brought in the chat box. Prazosine use, is it okay in pregnancy? Do you use prazosine in pregnancy? No. Okay. No, no. All right, perfect. Okay, we will continue our discussion. Uh, let me have Dr. Shankar. Dr. Shankar is a senior physician who is pretty much with us with every single huddle session. Dr. Shankar, if this patient was to visit you, how would you uh, approach? Uh, good evening to all. Uh... Coming to the index case, uh, to make a long story short, uh, so there is a family history of hypertension is there. In this case, uh, 29 years of old female hypertensive. So I think it is uh, only essential hypertension. Uh, so investigations uh, regarding the secondary cause can be done. But uh, when she is referred from an infertility clinic and she is due for uh, IVF, uh, I stop uh, ramipril and hydrochlorothiazide and uh, I put uh, her on to safer drugs because uh, at any time uh, she may conceive or becomes pregnant. Uh, so I better uh, give uh, uh, nifedipine long acting one. And if at all, uh, uh, if there is uh, any tachycardia, then uh, I add uh, labetalol because uh, uh, metoprolol, suppose if we, she becomes pregnant, uh, metoprolol is not, uh, uh, it is a second line drug only. It is not uh, uh, um, well proved uh, in the pregnancy. Uh, earlier we used to give, but now the labetalol is alpha and beta blocker. Uh, it is uh, safer and uh, the methyl dopa also a third safer drug uh, can be given uh, uh, in this uh, childbearing age group uh, but uh, uh, it is not available i think in the market because we are not getting uh, so i prefer to give nifedipine long acting and a libertalol because anyhow she has to take uh, Labotalol uh, during her pregnancy. So uh, I, before pregnancy, uh, I start her on labotalol. I change, I stop ramipril and hydrochlorothiazide. And uh, once uh, she conceives and becomes pregnant, and her hypertension associated with the pregnancy, now it will be categorized as uh, chronic hypertension. So. Mm, in the early trimester of pregnancy, uh, BP usually falls. Hence, uh, we have to reduce the dosage of uh, whatever the drug we give, nifedipine or labetalol, we have to reduce the dose. Sometimes uh, we have to stop also because uh, when the BP falls uh, below 120 by 80, that is not advisable during pregnancy because uh, the utero-placental uh, perfusion will be compromised. Uh, there will be intrauterine growth retardation will be there. So uh, I maintain uh, BP not to fall below 140 by 90. Thank you so much, sir. We will continue our discussion. Uh, let me see who all is there. 
May I have Dr. Praveen? Uh, Dr. Praveen, if you could unmute yourself, I have got two questions for you. Number one is your thoughts about this case. And number two, uh, as a cardiologist, when do you start thinking about coarctation in these patients? We know that the incidence of coart is higher in females. Uh, in terms of uh, when to explore, do you have an age cutoff? If your physical examination of all the four limbs is normal, does that exclude coart? How do you how do you work on this? And then what would you do for this particular patient, Dr. Praveen? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> sir, uh, regarding this case, uh, as the patient is already having a positive family history, I would uh, consider it to be an uh, essential hypertension, and I will be just uh, uh, doing basic investigation. If the patient is not having a family history, uh, positive family history, then I would be uh, thoroughly evaluating for the secondary causes of hypertension, sir. Uh, the uh, most uh, common would be as the patient is ha also having a issue of infertility and all that, uh, I would be looking uh, uh, regarding in favor of the endocrine causes of uh, hypertension. Uh, So the again uh, in the endocrine causes probably the uh, most common would be the um, metabolic syndrome uh, which would be causing the polycystic ovarian syndrome and uh, 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 leading to the infertility. So the uh, common anthropometric parameters as well as the basic investigations can be seen for the uh, during the evaluation of uh, hypertension. Sir. And uh, the next would be uh, the aldosteronism. Uh, if at all uh, this patient is uh, wants to, uh, <clears throat> uh, everything is normal uh, and uh, thinking of the coarctation of iota, if the usual examination is showing all uh, peripheral pulses to be felt, uh, then I would not consider the possibility of coarctation. But if the a patient age is less than 20 years and patient is uh, still having the all the peripheral pulses felt, uh, it, uh, the coarctation should be uh, ruled out by doing a detailed evaluation uh, by echocardiography. If the patient uh, is having all peripheral pulses felt and uh, the uh, BP blood pressure is not on the uh, what you call uh, it is in the uh, moderate range, then uh, coarctation can't be considered. But if the age of the patient is very less, that is less than uh, 25, uh, even though uh, physical examination is normal, then coarctation should be ruled out by doing uh, uh, detailed uh, evaluation by imaging. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Praveen. I will continue my discussion with the uh, rest of the attendees. Dr. Gauri is here with us. Dr. Gauri is a general physician with an expertise in uh, uh, psychiatry, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Dr. Gauri, uh, give us your impression about the case that we are discussing today and the issues of starting young females on ACE inhibitors on hydrochlorothiazide. Is it something, is it something to worry where uh, the whole idea is you don't want to give uh, a very time-tested drug with the fear that what if they get pregnant while taking those drugs versus you think that most of the patients, they do understand the implications and they take this drug and they will consciously come to you if they are planning for pregnancy. So what do you think we should do in these young females? Should we just err on the side of caution and not prescribe ACE inhibitors and hydrochlorothiazide to these? Uh, and what would you do for this particular case that we are talking, Dr. Gauri? Um, um, thank you, Dr. Anup. And I think this is such a wonderful case uh, you know, young women uh, coming with hypertension in itself is a is a challenge because you know th these cases, though they are increasing, they are one of a kind, right? Because th they usually do not uh, think that something like this is going to happen to them. But I think a lot of time I usually spend with such a patient is to understand, you know, she's a twenty nine year old, so taking a lot more detailed history, you know, um, 
understanding her BMI, understanding, you know, is there smoking, uh, you know, any drug history, has she been on any regular drugs, you know, OCPs, for example, she's now trying for pregnancy, how many, how long was she trying for pregnancy, uh, you know, drug compliance itself, she's been on two years on Ramipril and hydrochlorothiazide, how does it, how is it for her to be on medications, right? What are the side, has she experienced any side effects or something else? You know, what about taking these drugs and how does she feel about it, right? I think is very important. And considering that there is a family history, does she understand the implications of long-term, you know, being on long-term medication, chronic disease? Um, and does she understand about, you know, has there been any early deaths in the family? You know, how is that? So I think a lot more, uh, you know, in detail discussion will, uh, even even for that matter, stressors, anxiety, right? What all things are there that is kind of worrying her because she's getting into a uh, place of where she's going to plan, uh, you know, they are going to plan for a family. And these things have to be spoken about very clearly to the patient. You know, as a physician, I would always want to do that with her because that helps us to rule out what could be the add-ons, which is making her, her hypertension, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, more than just the, uh, the essential hypertension part that we are seeing. I mean, most probably even I would think of this as, as essential hypertension. But if, she, if, if this is the first time that I'm seeing and I know that she's been on medication, I would want to know her history, you know, how was the diagnosis made? And if there have been no reports done in the recent past, definitely looking at you know, her blood counts, her thyroids, especially, you know, I'm sure that the gynecologist must have done it, but, you know, it's a good idea to just look at it again. Uh, you know, kidney functions, you know, is there microalbumin, uh, microalbumins, uh, you know, getting a basic cardiac workup. Um, I would want to look at the kidney, uh, you know, uh, electrolytes, creat, and the kidney in general, just to be on the um, safer side, to be sure that everything is all right, because she's going... Uh, into a phase where she's going for in, in vitro fertilization. So all I would want to be cautious about it. Now, typically patients are of two kinds. There are certain, and it, it helps when we tell them very clearly that, well, you know, there are the, you know, the, you know, the first choice of drug in, in anybody of this age with essential hypertension would be an ACE inhibitor or, or the drugs that she's on, which is, which is what anybody would prescribe. And it's a right prescription right, in that sense, from a drug perspective, but considering that she's going, you know, she's planning for pregnancy, these may not be the drugs that would help her, you know, which would be given in due, you know, when, if she gets pregnant, when, as and when we know about that. So I think that discussion has to happen very clearly with the patient for them to understand there is a risk involved in this. Um, there have been, you know, um, pros and cons that need to be discussed. In most cases, patients that I have seen, they usually would want to be on a safer drug from the beginning. And as I agree with all the other doctors who have said, uh, you know, either starting on a calcium channel blocker or getting onto a labetalol later is, is much better uh, than, you know, because you don't know when she's going to get pregnant. And um, uh especially if it's not a hospital setup where she is visiting and it's a clinic setup like where I sit, it becomes a problem because you do not, the, the challenge of the patient coming back may not, you know, is, is something that you deal with, right? So here uh, we put everything in, in front of the patient and say, well, this is a more safer choice, right? Because we do not know when that is going to happen. But in a hospital setup, what happens because the gynec and the physician uh, will be in, in, you know, kind of tandem in, in terms of working with the patient. So it, it is still okay for her to be on an ACE inhibitor, uh, you know, a diuretic combination till the time that she gets pregnant and then switch over. But in a clinical, I mean, in a small clinic kind of setup, I would always take the safer route and explaining to her, I absolutely agree. Ankle edema is really, I mean, it, it, it is a problem. I have had patients who were on CCBs and I had to change them to Lebetalol because the ankle edema was very bad. And they, it was just very bad during, as the pregnancy progressed, you know. So, uh, but I think some some of them uh, tolerated, some don't tolerate it. I think that is, um, I think each, each patient I think is different. So um, um, that that's how I would, you know, kind of approach this patient. Ma'am, you have any experience with methyl dopa? Because a lot of cardiologists we we not we tend to not prescribe this. No, I'm, I'm so sorry. Even I don't like. I would, as I agree with everybody, I will go with a calcium channel blocker, and that will be typically a nifedipine, uh, typically, or it will be labetalol, right? 
you know methyl dopa usually not much hydrolazine i i have seen prescriptions with hydrolazine but i have not prescribed it myself but i have seen prescriptions where the patients have been on hydrolazine that's right, another you know hydrolazine certainly is one of the approved drugs in pregnancy and approved means most of the drugs have limited mm-hmm. approval Hmm. uh hydral hydralazine certainly remains the key drug for hypertensive emergencies in terms of yes. iv hydralazine yes i never had a good luck getting iv hydralazine in india it was our go to drug in us where uh it was very easily available hmm. in india it is difficult i don't know if anybody has used iv hydralazine in an otherwise non pregnant patient as well but certainly in pregnancy if you are dealing with uh, hypertensive crises then amongst the options that you have iv hydralazine is one of the option that can be used we just don't know about the availability and uh, i have seen oral i have seen yes. patients for oral hydralazine but not as much with methyl dopa to be very honest i don't know why though we have always studied about methyl dopa but somehow it is not seen as much uh, not sure why right so oral hydralazine is available in india we have been prescribing it in a 25 mg dose yes. three times a day yes or as a combination with nitrates where it is prescribed in the dosing of 37.5 mg and that can also be given twice or three times a day those are the two combinations of hydralazine or preparations that i have seen in india and i'm yet to see an iv formulation which uh, i was very fond of particularly to resolve acute crises one thing we do have to understand that patients who have got uh, Uh, essential hypertension or chronic hypertension when they go in for pregnancy they are the one who are at higher risk for preeclampsia and eclampsia so while we do want to talk about permissive hypertension in uh, pregnant women we do have to understand that the onus of uh, preventing uh, hypertensive crises during pregnancy also to certain degree lies on us so we have to make sure that while we don't over treat them we also don't under treat them Uh, because uh, eclampsia is associated with very high morbidity and mortality so that is something we do have to take care of uh i think uh, in the last 20 25 minutes we had a lot of discussion about the drugs about what to do the common theme that i got was uh, doctors would like to play safe in young women in terms of prescribing drugs which can potentially create problem during pregnancy so it is better to start with safer drug in these women and once their family is complete then then it can be switched to a more long term chronic management mm-hmm. i also understand that a lot of us are in favor of just doing limited investigations at this point of time rather than seeking aggressive causes for secondary hypertension which uh, uh, the consensus is that you would do if the age is really young like less than 20 or what not doing a renal uh artery doppler as a screening tool i don't know where we stand there and also doing a screening echo to rule out coarctation that is also something uh, where the science is not very clear or the guideline is not very clear if the physical examination is normal then whether adding echo for coact makes any sense or not that is again something we can discuss and uh, the other thing we can also discuss is what would be the ideal target blood pressure when she goes into pregnancy for us to achieve are we okay with 140 or do we permit them to go up to 160 or we want to be very aggressive and uh, and target 120 blood pressure so some of these things uh, do need to be addressed i like pravin's idea of screening for pcod well uh, most of the time when these patients they come to us then their obstetrician have already worked upon that this particular patient was evaluated for pcod and was found to be okay by the time she came to me she had a set of routine investigations which included hemogram renal profile electrolytes thyroid study and she had a bunch of uh, uh, hormonal profile done mostly related to obstetrics like uh, uh prolactin and what not i can't recollect what all hormonal profile she got and uh, she pretty much passed on most of those investigations one thing that i do look in the electrolytes is hypokalemia if patients who have got significant hypokalemia which cannot be explained then that certainly raises my radar of uh, primary hyperaldosteronism in these cases although the recent data do suggest that patients with primary hyperaldo they do not necessarily need to be hypokalemic and the incidence probably is higher than what what we expected to 
The other question, which is also unanswered, is the role of spironolactone in pregnant women. And uh, I have never prescribed one. I don't know if anybody has prescribed. I don't know what the data would suggest. But certainly in young female, I would have I, I had never prescribed spironolactone. And I would think it probably is not a good idea because it is a hormonal drug and uh, it, it probably is going to affect the fetus as well. Although I don't have the data behind it. So if anybody has got any thoughts to share, they can raise their hands or unmute themselves while I continue my discussion with my other attendees for today's session. We have Dr. Srinivas with us. Dr. Srinivas is cardiologist uh, with us at Care Hospital. Sir, if this patient had to come to you from the cardiac standpoint, how would you approach it in terms of, do you think uh, thinking about COACT at this point of time is reasonable or is it overkill? And, understand, and considering the higher incidence of FMD in these patients, uh, do you routinely order renal ultrasound in these kind of patients? So, Srinivas, sir, your approach to this case and the two questions that I asked you. Yes, Dr. Anup, uh, thank you. I think all the points were well covered by all the previous uh, discussions. The issue about uh, being uh, coag being under the workup Already this patient is under follow-up for two years and uh, extensive workup is done. So probably it is only essential hypertension. And due to the stress of IVF and she being uh, going through the first pregnancy, that could be the reason her uh, hospital recordings could be on the higher side. If we could uh, record her blood pressures at home, that would give us the true blood pressures. And there's no need to further step up the blood pressure unless we confirm on two, three occasions. Probably IUF is the reason for stress for her and uh, we could put her through a program like yoga. And uh, fibromuscular dysplasia being picked up on ultrasound, unlike atherosclerotic uh, renal artery stenosis wherein the ostium of the uh, renal arteries are involved, fibromuscular dysplasia is not well picked up on uh, routine uh, renal artery dopplers. I mean, that would uh, uh, be better answered by radiologists, but my information is uh, it's difficult to pick up fibromuscular dysplasia as compared to an atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Thank you so much, sir. I think during pregnancy, a lot of these drug of choice is up in the air and uh, the reasoning being that uh, pregnancy is a substrate where most of these drugs are not tested. So one of the idea of why people choose nifedipine or labetrolol or uh, uh, methyl dopa or whatnot is most more historical because this had been used for about 30 years now, 20 years now, and uh, historically they have been proven safe. So people continue to use it and uh, there is no active attempt to look at the safety of other drugs during pregnancy understanding that the first generation drugs do carry with them high incidence of uh, adverse effects. So while there is lack of data, we do have our own practice patterns. So in these practice patterns, I'm going to ask a few questions to my audience and I will be putting them in the chat box and please feel free to select uh, which of the, uh, what would be your answer for uh, the particular questions that I'm asking. These are very simple questions. I'm just trying to understand or get a feel of what you typically do. So my first question that I'm asking is, and I'm, I'm putting it in the chat box, is your choice of calcium channel blocker. It seems like dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker remains the first choice for a lot of attendees here. And of course, the comfort level is highest with nifedipine, understanding the reflex tachycardia and uh, the compliance issue where it needs to be taken two to four times a day. So if you were putting calcium channel blocker to a patient who potentially can become pregnant or who is already pregnant, what is your drug of choice? Nifedipine, amlodipine, or any other drug? And you can simply just type it in the chat box and I'll get a sense of what uh, my attendees uh, would do typically, understanding that amlodipine does not have data. Well, nifedipine also does not have data, but the comfort level with nifedipine is very high. So calcium channel blocker, your calcium channel blocker, your drug of choice, nifedipine versus um, amlodipine. A few of you, if you just type it in the chat box, I will get a sense of what uh, your recommendation would be. And while, while you do that, I will continue my discussion 
if anybody has got any other thoughts to add about this particular case, how would you approach? Is there anything else that you would do in this, uh, in this case? If no one has any other thoughts, may I ask uh, uh, Somaraju sir for his opinion about what, how he looks at this case and uh, uh, things that we have not covered or things that we have not looked into. Somaraju sir, if you could please unmute yourself and share your thoughts about today's discussion. Good, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Anup. Uh, uh, I will first want to know, uh, as we are all blamed as uh, uh, professionals in medicine, first, uh, know the person and not the disease. I want to know more about this person, what, what she does, what's her social and economic background, what's her typical day like, uh, that is important in uh, managing any chronic disease. So that's one thing you can answer later. Secondly, about uh, uh, primary, secondary, uh, why you are insisting on coactation so much when you felt all the uh, peripheral pulse are well felt and low-end limb blood pressures are taken, they are normal. I don't know why you are insisting on coactation. Uh, is it that coactation came as a surprise to you? Later, uh, you can tell us. And then uh, secondly, uh, as you already pointed out, amongst the secondary cause of hypertension, primary aldosteronism should be investigated, particularly in, uh, any person first time coming to you as a routine. And uh, potassium levels are almost normal, are mostly normal uh, in almost 50% of them. Uh, it may not reveal. Then, uh, uh, that's the reason why I do investigate some basic investigations of renin angiotensin, etc. They are indicated uh, first time when they come to you. Then, uh, when somebody has a hypertension at this age, hypertension and diabetes uh, go hand in hand. One wants to know whether there's a family history of diabetes in this person, whether it's HbA1c like otherwise. Uh, then, uh, the drug of choice, I would prefer the first choice. And, with the, <clears throat> many people already pointed out, uh, though calcium channel blockers do produce uh, edema as a problem, particularly in pregnancy, the long-acting nephrodipine is uh, less edema producing than amlodipine, and there is more data available on it. And methyl dopa we used to use, we hardly use it now. <laughs> then, uh, so anything else uh, you want to know uh, more, uh, then you didn't tell us her weight, you didn't tell us whether she has any sleep abnormalities, subtract to sleep apnea, etc. All those things I would inquire when I uh, deal with a patient like this. The best thing is uh, do ask them one simple question. Tell me your typical day and night. That, that helps. That includes food, their activities, physical activity, exercise, sleep pattern, etc. Thank you. So, sir, I will try to address some of the things that you mentioned. I don't have answer to all the questions that you have asked me. So, first, the easy one. Uh, the reason why I was particular about COAC was not related to this patient itself. My, my idea was that in young females, if we do have diagnosis of hypertension and if our physical examination seems to be normal. Now, I do want to emphasize the limitations of our physical examination because in this particular patient, I did not examine her femorals, I examined her dorsalis and dorsalis is fine, dorsalis and posterior tibial both, and they are both normal. So one of the question that I had in my mind is, even when the pretest probability is not very high, she's not somebody whom I would otherwise suspect co-opt out of uh, more out of the general population, but how confident I should be of my physical examinations to say that if I have got four uh, extremity pulses which look normal and I don't hear any murmur, then I should be pretty confident that I'm not dealing with coag. Is that enough for me or should I still explore? That was my main idea of talking about coag. You know, Anup, uh, can I interrupt you here? Yes, sir. Uh, in a young person coming with hypertension, at least one lower limb blood pressure should be checked apart from pulsations. 
Right, so in this patient, we did not check the lower limb uh, uh, blood pressure. We did uh, check blood pressure on both the arms and we checked, uh, as I said, peripheral pulses. Uh, I wish I, I checked her femorals as well because sometimes uh, femorals are better appreciated in terms of their decreased volume as compared to dorsalis. So that was the confidence which I was lacking. And I thought maybe it's a, it's a good platform to discuss whether, whether we can be confident with our physical examination. That is one. You mentioned about the profile of the patient. I don't have all the information. She's, she's a housewife. She has not, she was never uh, into uh, health evaluation and all this. Her interaction with uh, medicine was two years back when on a routine assessment, her blood pressure was found to be high. She followed with her doctor for about a year or so. And after that, she uh, lost follow-up, but she continued her medication. And in the last six months, they have been in and out of uh, obstetrics uh, OPD, mostly for infertility assessment. She's a, she's a, she's not a, she didn't strike to me as an obese woman. Her weight, if I have to guess, I don't remember the number, but her weight, if I had to guess, would be somewhere around 60, 65 kilograms. Her BMI would come around 24, 25. And I'm just telling you my eyeball test. I did not do, do an assessment. She does not have a history of uh, a family history of diabetes, which I mentioned before. And her current assessment also suggests she does not have diabetes. I don't know much detail about her daily activity. Although I gave her an open question about daily stressor in her life. And she, she replied saying, other than the routine activity, uh, she does not have anything in particular. She did not body habitus wise, she did not strike to me as somebody who would have obstructive sleep apnea. Although we do know that many of the times OSA uh, has a total disregard to obesity and sometimes even in uh, lean and thin people, we see uh, OSA at times. She had not been tested for OSA and I did not advise uh, testing for OSA in this patient as well. Her husband does has a business of his own and uh, he also didn't seem as if there is overtly uh, any stressful situation at home other than what is quite obvious, which is infertility. Somebody mentioned that uh, infertility is an stressor to her, which I certainly do agree that if they are uh, uh, in and out of uh, the center for six months, then certainly that would act as a stressor. So those are some of the uh, points that I have. I don't have other information in terms of what her overall day is like and how much extra physical activity she does other than her routine uh, daily work. So, so that is all that I have got. And I don't have any particular um, thing that, that she would be a high risk for co opt or I would have a higher suspicion. I was just wondering how we should approach these patients. Primary hyper -eldo, uh, the workup is a little bit sketchy in terms of doing a 24 hour urine analysis because the renin aldosterone ratio has been discussed previously. And uh, there, was a, there was a very good data, I believe, coming out of UK or US, I don't remember where, where it was. Thousands and thousands of patients were tested uh, with, a, with a renin uh, aldosterone ratio and compared it with the gold standard 24-hour urine analysis. And the results were all over the place. So the author recommended that, that renin aldosterone ratio, unless it is in the extremes, they are really not helpful in diagnosing uh, primary hyperaldo. So how to diagnose primary hyperaldo, that, that is also something which, which is still not very clear. And this becomes even more challenging in patients who are on ACE inhibitors or who are on mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, because there it becomes very difficult to correctly interpret their renin and aldosterone levels. So I did not check for uh, primary hyperaldo in, the, uh, in her situation. I did not order for uh, echo or co or anything. I actually wanted to order for renal Doppler. I did not order because uh, uh, even if she had renal artery stenosis, till the time her blood pressure is reasonably controlled, I wouldn't do anything different than what I was doing at that point of time. But this is in my mind that in the future, if I do deal with a situation where her blood pressure is not controlled, maybe that is something I should look at. So I personally, in, in my OPD, I, what I did, I will tell you, and then maybe we can uh, comment on that. I stopped her uh, ACE inhibitor and I stopped her hydrolazine. I did what most of you suggested. I did put her on calcium channel blocker. Uh, I started her on nifedipine, long acting, 20 milligrams twice daily. 
although most of you are writing in the chat box that you your drug of choice would be amlodipine uh, but i did put her on uh, on uh, nifedipine for uh, for the pregnancy purpose i wanted to play as safe as possible although it does seem like uh, uh, amlodipine would be a reasonable option as well so that was that was my idea behind it i think this hypertension uh, and pregnancy is something which is which is very common uh, to obstetrician, it is not that common to us, probably because they are managed by obstetrics and general physician. But this is something which is which which we should be taking it very seriously. Uh, I, uh, I'm reading the chat box. Levetrolol can cause hyperkalemia. I don't know, uh, Praveen. Is it true? Can levetrolol cause hyperkalemia? I never thought of that. Beta blockers in pregnancy can cause fetal hypoglycemia. That is something which is a known phenomena other than intrauterine growth retardation and whatnot, and fetal bradycardia, uh, beta blocker as a general can cause fetal hypoglycemia. So if you put a patient on beta blocker, you should tell the obstetrician and the neonatologist who will be managing the baby later on that they should be cautious about hypoglycemia in those patients. So uh, let me ask, ask some other thoughts on this. Uh, Dr. Gopi Krishna, you didn't say anything about today's topic. If I may have you unmute yourself and share your thoughts, if there is anything you could add to today's discussion. Dr. Gopi Krishna, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. Yes, please yeah, go ahead. Dr. Please Dr. go ahead. No, good evening. Actually, it's a well described case. But the thing is, I'm not uh, listening any history of like uh, hy uh, hypothyroidism in this case. Uh, is she known case of hypothyroidism because it's also the common thing uh, to be evaluated uh, for young hypertension whoever uh, because uh, we should not think that as the family history is there in this patient mother and father are hypertension we should not presume that it's a primary hypertension but uh, hypothyroidism is common that too in infertility patient which uh, as uh, somebody described is like a overweight or a borderline obesity patient with infertility presentation clinic uh, presentation so uh, any history of uh, hypothyroidism in this patient? No. So this patient is tested for thyroid because, you know, she's in an infertility clinic. The first thing they check for is thyroid. Uh, yeah. She's fine. Thyroid is fine. Yeah. Dr. Anup, uh, can I interrupt you? Yes, sir. Please. <clears throat> With their blood pressures as they are, uh, when you start nephilipine lung acting, 50 milligrams twice a day for a lot of patients in this country is too stiff a dose. Okay. That is that is United States uh, uh, okay. So we generally start ten milligrams a day or ten milligrams twice a day, and then slowly step up. Okay. Because hypotension can be a significant issue in such doses. Okay. Point yes, taken. Most of the patients are comfortable with the ten mg twice doses. And the thing is uh, here, uh, how generally we, before going for, uh, definitely, as everybody said, uh, aggressively going for uh, evaluation with the investigations uh, is definitely not encouraged. But the thing is, uh, we can have a clinical evaluation, like a history and uh, most of the time exam, uh, clinical examination will give us a lot of uh, clues whether to evaluate further or not. Like uh, everybody, we know that uh, the criteria to rule out secondary hypertension, we should know actually by history, whether age is uh, less than 30 or uh, other hypertension is resistant or uh, any sudden deterioration of BP is there in the past or uh, evidence of endocrine damage. That is the one thing we can uh, look like uh, if uh, routine urine examination, dip stick test, if you found positive or like a eye examination, retina examination, hypertensive retinopathy, or uh, if in previous echoes any uh, like uh, today, echo uh, suggestive of uh, LV dysfunction or uh, serum creatinine level uh, elevated, such things, and also like uh, uh, some uh, other things like a clinical examination as a routinely we when we are uh, examining like uh, as everybody said pulses two upper limbs one lower limb better to examine like that because uh, um, the first thing to diagnose between the coagulant or something is upper limb lower limb pressure discrepancy only and. Uh, Abdominal brewery examination of abdominal brewery for uh, it's not only for this uh, routine coagulant or some uh, Takayasu arthritis also commonly I'm seeing uh, in clinical practice uh, coagulated brewery abdominal brewery and subclavian brewery and uh, all those things also should be examined routinely because it's just time consuming process but uh, better we can rule out the second case by examination itself and uh, acne and uh, stria moony faces they can uh, suggest of Cushing syndromes like that and uh, 
like history of uh, flushing sweating and uh, palpitations uh, like uh, episodic type of things they can give like a clue of a few chromocytoma these type of things at least you can rule out uh, by examination uh, only and uh, uh, most of the time uh, we can ecg is sufficient to know the lvh if uh, lvh is there then we can proceed for the further test like uh, to do go for ruling out the other uh, coagulation or uh, some other causes but uh, i think european guidelines uh, they are given little bit uh, ease um, about the further investigations so they are uh, almost like a Uh, recommending uh, even 2d echo even uh, doppler test and mr ct angiography on suspected cases in any uh, individual diuretics definitely regarding all drugs uh, uh, the opinion is almost same um, by the all the doctors but the diuretics definitely is not increasable even in the young patient because it's like uh, they are uh, use uh, like uh, in especially the child bearing age who are planning to pregnant um, in the future So leading to oliguria and uh, hypotension, uh, and uh, um, the other thing is uh, early onset of diabetes also one of the concern uh, in these type of patients. So better manage the alternative drugs, as everybody said, rather than these drugs. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gopi Krishna. Really appreciate uh, your comments on this. Uh, this is certainly these are certainly points that we didn't discuss in uh, up to now. Uh, this whole. Broy business, and you know, I'm I'm just trying to be very pragmatic, very very open about it. Uh, every single patient whom I have done a renal artery stenting, which is less than ten, so far, every single patient with a diagnosed renal artery stenosis, I tried my level best to put my electronic stethoscope and listen for Broy, and for the sake of my life, I couldn't hear it. now i can pretend to say that you know oh yeah i hear bru and this and that and what not but uh, even in patient with diagnosed renal artery stenosis i could not train my eyes to hear for those bru now i'm sure there are situations with body habitus and what not where i may be able to pick it up the reason why i say so is because uh, when i get feedback like these in my routine assessment it reduces my confidence in a random case where if i don't hear a bru whether whether i can confidently exclude stenosis in that particular situation be it renal be it subclavian be it be it what not so once a while uh, i keep doing this in my clinical practice uh, as a way to retrospectively train my uh, my ears and uh, so far i have not developed that kind of confidence i'm sure that few of us we have better ear to listen and uh, certain certainly body habitus of the patient does matter Uh, when we look at these kind of uh, entities uh, so having said that uh, we can we can start closing the session uh, sumaraju sir if you don't mind can i just ask your overall impression about few drugs that we don't have good idea about uh, clonidine in pregnancy is it something that you have ever used will you recommend in situations of extreme that we can use it clonidine uh... is considered safe to use but uh, it's never a first choice drug if you are not able to use any other drug uh, any of the other drugs mentioned uh, by most of you clonidine can be given but it has significant side effects not only bradycardia but again mind you sudden withdrawal can produce significant serious issues of precipitating a, a crisis hypertension so how about Sorry, sir. How about prazosine? Uh, prazosine, uh, we have no experience, and uh, there is not enough experience uh, published. Uh, and how about the last thing? How about nitrates? Do you use nitrates in pregnancy? Nitrate. Yeah. Uh, for what? For hypertension management in pregnancy. Which nitrate? Like uh, nitroglycerin infusion or sorbitrate, GTN sorbitrate, or those kind of things. In general. IV- uh nitrates were even in hypertensive crisis uh particularly important to realize uh, even non pregnancy when you need an intravenous uh, preparation to bring down the blood pressure uh, in the absence of uh, acute coronary syndrome or continuing angina nitrate intravenous nitroglycerin should be avoided because it takes away the blood brain barriers and uh, it's not a safe drug in that situation 
for hypertension. Sir, you said it takes away what? We didn't get catch blood, your last blood brain barrier. Blood brain barrier. Okay, it takes it takes away the blood brain barrier. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, thank you, sir. That was those were the three drugs that were getting in my mind. Uh, anybody has got any other questions or comments or suggestions or something that you want to ask Somaraj sir as well? I do want to emphasize about the drugs that we were talking. One drug that we did not talk and that is ARB because ARBs are often clubbed with ACE inhibitors. And I do want to emphasize that uh, probably villain number one is ARB because there is absolutely no data supporting ARBs use in pregnancy as well as in lactation. So ARB is one drug that we should definitely avoid. Uh, how to treat lactating women, that's altogether a different topic because now the restrictions of pregnancies are no more. And to my understanding, most of the drugs can be given during lactation. Uh, of course, we have to watch for the fetus in case if you're know if you giving beta blocker, then fetal bradycardia and whatnot. But for most part, to my understanding, the drugs can be given during lactation, except uh, ARB that, that uh, I mentioned about. Uh, if anybody has got any other final comments before we close the session? Praneet, your closing comments about today's discussion? Yeah, uh, a, a good discussion uh, that we had. I know it's a very difficult case. Uh, pregnancy and hypertension uh, is really challenging to manage both because the drugs that are available to manage is limited. The safety profile is limited. And equally, the drugs that we give, the pharmacokinetics change because of the change in uh, hemodynamics with the pregnancy, increase in the volume of distribution, the protein binding capacity, a lot of parameters change. So uh, managing uh, a pregnant lady with drugs uh, really is challenging. And probably for the same reason, uh, it is difficult that we do not have enough data to support the new molecules or the drugs that we use it. And uh, as you said, the all the data that we have is all old data and we still keep continuing the same. But uh, the key takeaway points probably are the safer alternatives being the calcium channel blocker, long-acting nifedibine being the preferred uh, drug of choice and uh, maybe if not controlled, then uh, beta blockers, also highlighting the point of uh, evaluating the secondary causes like maybe obesity, uh, endocrine causes, etc. always to be considered and uh, rule out them and uh, avoid in a situation or be in a situation where you can give uh, avoid uh, giving them drugs. So again, a lot of unanswered questions and definitely an uncomfortable situation which most of them will be in managing uh, these type of patients. So uh, these are my thoughts, Anup. Thanks. Thank you, Praneet. And thank you all of you for attending today's session. As you all know, we record all these uh, discussion. And uh, so far, 51 episodes have been uploaded on YouTube or uh, on podcast. So you can use your dead time and go back and uh, listen to some of these uh, if uh, those topics are of interest to you. And we are looking for suggestions for uh, future huddle topics. So if you have anything that you think we should discuss, please feel free to WhatsApp me or you can WhatsApp on the group as well. Lastly, if you are not a part of our uh, WhatsApp uh, uh, group, I urge you to, um, uh, to uh, join that because we do continue our discussion after the huddle discussion as well. I thank you all for your time and attention. I wish you all a uh, happy evening and good night. And we will see you next Wednesday again with a new topic. Thank you guys and all the best. Thank you, Dr. Anup.